Good evening, 7.12 p.m. here in Vancouver. I just to check, make sure that the, um, again, audio, I've been having challenges with this little audio thing, and I want to make sure that you can hear me clearly. And if you can, let me know, and I'm going to talk to you about sex. This was the question earlier today. I was like, oh, a sex question. Sex questions are very triggering. <laughs> when people talk about sex, people within relationships, it's probably one of the biggest triggers within a relationship. Uh, it's the topic of conversation. People perk up. You put the topic sex on the top of, uh, of a magazine or a book, and now everybody's interested. But first, I want to make sure you can hear me. Give me a thumbs up and let me know that you can hear me. And if so, I'm going to answer this one question. Somebody who messaged, and I'm going to share the message. Obviously, I'm not going to say who it was, but this person person um, just reached out to me and it was something that I wanted to share based on the conversations that I've been having with people who are on the brink of healing. They're like at the precipice. They know exactly what they need to do. They know what their wounds are and they get to this. Thank you, Maureen. They get to this point where they're like, they need to make a leap. Maureen, you know this. This is your great situation with you. You're on this precipice. You know that, that where the wounds are, you know what needs to be done, but the problem is I don't trust myself. I don't trust myself that I'm going to do the work. I don't trust myself that I'm going to get it. I don't trust myself that I'm going to actually heal. I, I might fail. And it's interesting because those are the two conversations that I can actually blend in on today's Trigger Proof Transmission tonight's trigger proof transmission to, ha to hopefully answer it all because the goal of me helping you with this question anybody who's listening will be able to resonate with this question that's highly triggering and if we don't heal this and we don't get this right and we don't mend that and we don't get to the root cause and we don't do the necessary examination self-examination and we don't go down that path what happens is it impacts all of our relationships moving forward because the baggage from the last relationship I am literally carrying with me into the next one and any incomplete that I have with my partner last partner spills into the new one spills into the next relationship any trauma that hasn't really fully been healed that I'm still playing a victim to from my last relationship that I feel victimized by, I'm going to play it out in some form, some fucked up form in my new relationship. It's going to happen. So this lends to the conversation of a lack of self-trust. And so the question was, what do I do if I'm in this relationship and we broke up a while back, but I just can't forget them because of the sexual bond? I, 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 I'm addicted. It's kind of like I'm addicted to them. I'm addicted to going back to them. I'm, I'm addicted to how great the sex was. I just feel like I'm never going to be able to have that level of connection in a new relationship. Okay, this is this was the question. People will message me and then they'll tell me the, the backstory. I have a question for you. Then they'll tell me all of that and then they'll say, this is what I feel like. And then I'm like, great. So what's the question? What's the question? You just told me what's going on. What's the question? In other words, first decide what it is that you want. If that's the situation that's happening, great. I can't get over my ex. I've just had a, had a breakup. People will message me all the time in DMs, especially now it's gone through the roof. I can't keep up with anymore. Relationship breakdowns, toxic relationships, all these triggers our fucking pandemic right now. And so my inbox is flooded. So I'm in a situation where I have only the time to help certain people. I can only help the people that are actually committed to solving the problem. It's like a triage. Okay, this is kind of like I read this. Uh, the rule, the handbook rules of a lifeguard. Okay, let's say you're a lifeguard. And now you've just you're now like on a raft and you only have a certain number of life jackets resources to only help a certain number of people 
and there's a shit ton of people around you that need help, who do you choose to help? Let me turn that around for you right now. Who is it that you choose to help? The answer is, here's the answer according to lifeguard system. The people that you choose to help in those situations are the ones that are actually swimming towards you. So right now my inbox has been flooded with, especially women, a couple of guys actually who are stuck and they're really, but a, the ones that are becoming more conscious and like wanting to take ownership. But g generally it's an 80, 20 women to men reaching out for me, reaching out to me and they will d jump into my inbox and they'll say things like, I can't get, they'll, they'll just dump, boom, 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 perfect. Then I'm just sitting there because this is the thing, because I'm reading It's just, here's what's happening. And the, 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 the intention behind my question for you in that is, what the fuck do you want? <laughs> At the risk of sounding like an asshole, it's just how I am. What the fuck do you, yes, this is what happened. You can't get over him. You're constantly thinking about him. Uh, you, you are codependent, essentially I'm codependent with somebody else who's not willing to do their healing work. Great. So what do you want? That's the first question that helps to sift through if I can help this person or not. What do you want? And this person said, well, I, I, can I get over them? I, can I, can I really, is what, what she said. Um, my fear is that I'm now completely stained by being with them for a future love. I knew it felt great, but I should have been careful. I'm afraid that I will obsess about them and think about them in a way, that way in the future. In other words, I won't get over them. Also, that I'll feel embarrassed or ashamed when they eventually, when they eventually meet someone new. That feeling of rejection, that feeling of I'm not enough, that feeling of I'm missing out and I will always care about that person more than another. Or compare myself to the other person that he's with because I'm jealous and I'm less than her. I know it's a created future scenario, but I also think that's how I tend to think. Essentially what she's telling me is that she's an insecure, anxious attached. What's happening? She's an insecure, anxious attached. Hey, Ashley. Hey, Michael. What's up? This is a good one. Essentially what she's saying is, I'm an insecure attached. Now what do I do? <laughs> I'm like, okay, great. You're insecure attached. Thank you. What's your question? How can I be of assistance to you? How can I avoid this or change my perception with your wisdom? Okay, cool. Um, I, I basically told her, I said, ah, you are aware that you have a big emotional charge around this and you want to not be so obsessed. And she's like, yes. I try to figure out what is it that you really want. Ah, you're aware that you have a big emotional charge around this, a past lover that you can't get over, and you want to not be so obsessed. In other words, I'm, I'm an insecure, anxious attached, which is very common, by the way, and I'm carrying these rocks in my backpack, and how do I glide into my next relationship and not have that? And I said, oh, okay, well, that's easy. So whether it's sex addiction, whether you feel whatever the answer is you must heal the actual core wound that this gentleman has brought up in you your unconscious self has been pulled to his unconscious self because there's something familiar you knew it right when you first met and the chemistry I bet you was fucking gold that, my dear, is not a relationship. It's a bond. There's a difference between a relationship and a bond. A bond is something that you can, like if you, let me give you an example. If you and I were in a bank together, if you and I were in a bank together, and we're just at the teller, you're at one teller, at the other, and we're just going about our business, making a deposit, doing some banking, and then all of a sudden some asshole walks in with a gun and says, Everybody on the floor, get down. All of a sudden, you and I jump, like we fall to the floor and we're like terrified and we're looking right at each other. And we spend the next eight hours in this hostage negotiation thing. And then we eventually get out. Well then, my dear, you and I 
or good sir, you and I are now bonded. We, we don't have a relationship. We have a bond based on trauma. Most relationships that are toxic aren't actually relationships. They're trauma bonds from familiar patterns from childhood that are unhealed that you've actually by design been put together to face. And usually it's the ones with the deep sexual, like, oh my God, chemistry that happens right off the bat. That's often a trauma bond. It means that your unhealed wounds are a perfect match for with your father or mother are very similar in patterns with your dad, or if you're a guy or a masculine mom, and that unhealed pattern is so familiar, you get to live it out in this other person who has the exact opposite wounds that you're living out. And so the sexual chemistry becomes fucking electric. And you create what's called a passionate relationship. Had a call one of our clients and we were going over his mission statement and he wrote down, because we get you to do it when you're working with us, for shit you're going through right now, we start by creating a possibility of who you'd like to become. What do you want, in other words? Well, who do you want to be? What do you want to do? What do you want to have? And he wrote down, I want a passionate relationship with a partner. Because he's single and he's going through a breakup. And then I told him, I said, do you want to look at that again, brother? I said, take a look at it again. He's a wonderful guy. He's very conscious, very aware. Such a lovely human being. I love working with people like this who really want to step up and make change in the world. And they realize that they have to heal themselves. And they realize they can't lead others to where places where they haven't fucking yet been. And I've in that game. I've done that. I've led people to where I haven't been. And it felt incongruent. And I was like, ah, I'm going to stop doing that now. And he recognized. And I looked at his mission statement. He said, I'm a passionate lover. I said, let's look up definition of passion. What's the definition of passion? The definition of passion is to suffer. The passion of the Christ, to suffer. And if you look at all of your most passionate relationships, they're the ones that you suffered the most. In other words, it was based on a trauma bond, where the highs were were extremely high. Don't I know it? I was in that before. But the lows were fucking mind-blowingly shit. Welcome to a toxic codependent pattern. That's just the way it goes. First and foremost, what I want you to know is all of it makes complete sense. You and the way you showed up in that relationship makes complete sense and he the way he showed up in the relationship made complete sense and the fact that the sex was just so good also makes complete sense the way that you overcome that is to heal those primitive primary core wounds when you do you realize that the sex was only a distraction and a numbing from actually feeling real intimacy and that you actually weren't your authentic self in that relationship hardly ever and that the sex was often used as a numbing agent it's just the the main topic and if you didn't have sex you realize that you didn't really have much else in the relationship you'd actually i look back on those types relationships with my like that I've had in the past that were like highly addictive sexually I actually didn't enjoy spending time with them outside of the bedroom so weird I remember this one gal that I was in that relate this type of relationship with she would like come over hey come over for p.m. our day would start at 2 p.m. ah oh, we'd start hanging out and then it would eventually lead to sex and then more sex and then the sex right away and then a little bit more and then a little bit more and then just throughout the entire day and then i realized that outside of the sex just hanging out afterwards i'm like i don't really like this person so much i don't jive with them let's just keep having sex and over time of meeting that person and knowing her it'd be like 
like, why don't we meet at 5 p.m. now? So the time that I would spend with her not screwing would start to go down and it would just be, now it's like, okay, 7 p.m. So why don't I see you? Oh, we'll see you at 11. I just want to go about my day and then, listen, I just need to come over just for the sex. Let's not do anything because really, outside of that, I'm just not into it. So the reason why I'm doing that is um, it's not not because I'm proud of it. I'm not incredibly proud of it at all. I'm quite amused by it now, observing myself from this perspective, because rather than shaming myself and beating myself up for it, I understand why I was that way. I didn't know intimacy. I didn't understand that um, I had value outside of performing for somebody. I didn't have value in myself outside of like being a rock star, being, uh, being um, acknowledged for just being like the best. I did it as a performance, as a way to hide from showing the real me. And I'm, I'm saying that from this perspective now is because I've done the healing work to heal from those primitive attachment wounds that that relationship was energetically entangled with. And if I, I knew that if I did, it had to do with my mother and father, obviously, has to do with your mother and your father, obviously, oftentimes comes from this thing called emotional incest, where if you were daddy's little girl, okay, you were daddy's little girl, um, you kind of got emotionally entangled with a parent, you had to kind of grow up a lot faster and be the support emotionally, and they have your needs met, you have to play this role, that will play it that in a weird way, depending on your wounding, will actually spill over and it'll kind of recreate the same dynamic, which is exactly where these toxic dynamics come from. But when you heal from it, you then are able to heal that younger part of you that had to give themselves up and abandon themselves and play a role and play this, um, take on this responsibility at such a young age to take care of the emotional needs of a parent. Sometimes, 25% of the time, it's the sexual needs. That's a little triggering to talk about. It might really offend you, and I understand, nothing personal to you. This is 25% of people. And our clients who've been hiding shame around this, burying it, talking about it, basically hiding it in the freaking base, create chronic illness as a result of not exposing the truth about themselves. And so healing is scary. And so when I told her, I said, um, you, your solution is basically, she says, what do I do? I said, your solution is just to stop focusing on him and go all in with healing you. And she goes, oh my gosh. Um, she said, when you say you have to go all in with yourself, my first instinct is to avoid. And that's the next topic of this. Your first instinct when you go and you're facing the truth, okay? Now the truth, now this is why people, you know, hate me so much. Because they say, Dr. Nima, you fucking trigger the shit out of me. Get in line. I do this with everyone. There is nothing more triggering than the truth. It's just I'm working on becoming a lot more courageous to tell you the truth. Because I've lived a life of pretending and hiding it. It's part of my culture. It, it, it creates too much anxiety. Anxiety is caused by a, 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 a distraction from a lie, from a pretending, from a pretense, from a frac, from a, a fracture or a contradiction. And I discovered, here's the weird part, what I discovered. The more I can take those things that I'm trying to hide in the background and bring them to the forefront and share them openly, the less tension and constriction that I feel in my body. My body starts to heal and open up when I choose to do that. Is the sound working okay? Can you hear? Is the sound working okay? So, sorry about the sound. If you can't hear it, let me know if you can hear it. The more that I am willing to share the truth of what's here and be open about it, the less anxiety that I feel, the body starts to change. And so, you will come to this precipice where you had, you discover the truth, you know exactly what you need to do, 
but then all of a sudden, what happens? Well, here's the problem. You, you have chronically been conditioned to abandon yourself. You've chronically conditioned to hide from the truth. So for you to actually expose it, it's going to terrify the shit out of you. You say you want healing. This is why I left chiropractic full time. People said that they wanted healing. But the truth of the matter is what it takes to heal means taking off the mask and really going and healing all of your wounded parts that you left behind, that you consistently betray and abandon. You're called on to go meet that part of you. Fucking terrifying. I don't want to do that. That's too scary. Hopefully you can still hear it though, Maureen. Just slightly choppy, but you can still get the whole message. I know that's annoying. I'm going to do what I can with this thing. It's, it's good. Sometimes it works great. So what do you do? You actually fully commit to yourself. You actually fully practice and have a breakthrough in self-trust by actually trusting in yourself. It's like your higher self is waiting for you to step up and trust. It's waiting. This is like, imagine your younger self that you abandoned is like waiting with bated breath for you. But you're like, no, I don't want to look at you. I'm too afraid that if I look at you, you're going to take over my life and I will lose myself in you. But the exact opposite happens. When you take a look, you all of a sudden awaken your inner parent. You integrate that adult mind that you have with child mind that's been begging for you to integrate, to, to, to heal. And you're actually able to reconnect with yourself and to yourself and then commit to yourself. And all of these questions about commitment and you start to realize your relationships have way more depth than just the physical. That it's that that life is it, you don't have to numb yourself with sex anymore. You use it as a connection and a bonding activity. It doesn't become the foundation of your entire life. It doesn't become something you use to distract yourself. You then start to trust yourself more, and then the self trust starts to build. Self trust doesn't come just automatically. It's kind of like, it's like you're waiting for self-trust to show up before you jump in and feel it. But self-trust happens after you take that leap of yourself. And you might be thinking, well, what if I fail? What if I screw up? What if I don't get it right? What if it, I learn slowly? What if I keep on up? And to, to which I respond, guaranteed fail. Guaranteed you will mess up. Guaranteed, you won't get it right all of the time. Guaranteed, you'd have to pick yourself up again and again and again. It's like learning to walk. If you have a child and you're teaching them to walk, they take the first few steps and then they fall flat on their ass, are you going to tell them, this walking thing's not for you? No, they get back up and they keep going. Eventually, their body habituates and strengthens and and their capacity expands and then they've created a new normal. And that's how any healing will happen. It's not gonna be just like quickly doing a line or a column of the Demartini method and you're done. It doesn't work that way. That's an important piece, but only after you've taken care of your body-based unconscious responses. The trauma that's stored in the body, that feeling in your body that is, I don't feel safe. And the only way that I can feel safe is if I abandon myself and lose myself in this relationship and give up who I am and um, not have needs or boundaries of my own, that part of you needs to be addressed. And that's really what it takes. So we must go back to those primitive wounds. We must go back to the root of that codependency. And we must go and create and make it our business, our number one goal, as Dr. Shafali says, it takes two years, two years to heal those attachment wounds, not just cognitively, but in the body. And you might say, but I do counseling. But here's the thing about counseling. You're talking to someone on a cognitive level about things that happened in a body-based level, that feeling of anxious attachment. 
comes from having a primary caregiver who didn't have constancy, who wasn't there consistently, and who didn't show up like the same individual. They would come and go, and when they would come and go, when they would come back, you don't know if they were drunk, you don't know if they were checked out, they were high, they were even there. They would leave for long periods of time and you had so much chaos and trauma and you didn't have a rock at home that had consistency. Well, guess what? That lack of consistency, this push-pull, you start to confuse for love. And then when you go and you find a stable partner who loves you unconditionally, you're like, that's not love. That guy over there who's the asshole who pulls away and I have to chase, that familiar feeling is love. You've confused that for love. And that's in the body. It's not a rational choice. You, your mind, your rational mind knows, dude, I, I, I should go for, like your adult mind says, I should choose this person who treats me like royalty who's never ever raised his voice or her voice at me, who has a really secure and stable job, who's respectful, who's got a great relationship with their parents, that I'm gonna forego that, and I'm gonna go after that, that addict who's totally up and down, who I can constantly chase after, and hopefully, if I do this right, I can save them, I can rescue them, because they have such a good heart. I see through all of the, you know, I see through all of their um, criminal record. I see through all of their, you know, whatever that they have. You know what I mean? All of their gunshot wounds. For me, I see past the fact that, you know, she runs a, a high-end escort side business. That was me. Put that, I'll just leave the company to her. Take take over, take care. You know what? I see through that, I just wanna, that is codependency and that was my life. So I hear you, I see you. What did I do? I did the unthinkable. I knew that this wasn't about your partner. This is what I want you to know, the person who asked me this question. This is nothing to do with your partner and has everything to do with disconnection that you have, this resentment, this guilt, this shame, this emotional incest, this whatever overt or covert incest that you've had in your family dynamic that hasn't fully been healed, not just on a cognitive level, but on a body-based level so that you can then create that safety in here. You don't have this safety in here. You're going to seek it out in a relationship and try to numb yourself with sex. How do I know? That was me. And I'm here to tell you that there's nothing, the crowning jewel achievement of human existence is a secure attached relationship where you actually feel safe being with them and departing from them. The fact love spending time with them, but it's like, if you don't, you're not like completely paralyzed by anxiety. That there's an ease, a flow of joining together, but yet, you have an individuality that's you that has a separate sovereign entity, both of you. You know, that's not like neediness for one another in any way, but interdependence. Does that make sense? So that's the answer. And the, the way that you get that is through cultivation of self-trust by keeping one promise to yourself every day, one promise to yourself, whether you go to the gym, whether you're you know, not eating after six, whether you're journaling, whether you meditate every day, just one promise to yourself. And when you keep that promise to yourself each and every day, it has a twofold advantage for you. First one is think about what kind of a person you would keep a promise to. If, if you're a friend of mine and you see that I show up and I keep a promise to you, the message that I'm giving you is, I, I told you I'd call you at five, I'm going to do that and I'm calling you at five because I promised you. Why? Because you're that important. So if you keep a promise to something, that person is deemed important. Their level of relevance goes up. And if you keep a promise to that person, you then, if you keep that promise, you then become the kind of person who is his or her word. 
You have integrity. So you build integrity by keeping a promise to yourself. And then you build relevance, self-relevance, that you're worthy of being kept a promise to. And that's the physical action. Like I said, it takes a couple of years to heal from those attachment wounds. But it starts with the daily habits and daily actions. It starts with going back and healing those old resentments and those old grievances. It goes with learning how to become an observer to your triggers and learning how to take a trigger and turning it into deeper self-love. It comes with learning how to become an authentic empath, a conscious empath rather than an unconscious empath. Unconscious empathy is just as narcissistic as a narcissist. Unconscious empathy is trying to solve or fix so that you could be relevant, so that you could be approved of. It's just as selfish and narcissistic as the narcissist because the narcissist is a closet codependent who is completely dependent on that approval, that recognition, that other person to validate them. Both are narcissists and both are codependent. So these labels are, just throw them away and just own your part in it. That's how you set yourself free. So trusting yourself is difficult because you've conditioned to not trust yourself. You've conditioned to suppress yourself. You've conditioned to put yourself on low priority. So to actually enroll, to actually invest in solving the problem is your first step to self-trust. And number two, you will fail again and again on the game of learning how to self-trust. It's like riding a bicycle. Be willing to fail on the journey. Be kind to yourself and know that I'm not going to get it all the time. And I failure is a guarantee like learning any new skill. So let me put you at ease. Trust yourself that you will fail. Trust that it's okay to. Trust that it's a process that you practice using action and awareness. And so if this resonates with you and you actually want to heal from a breakup, you're one of those many that are reaching out and they just want to talk, I will talk to you if you are one of those people who are actually swimming towards me, not just wanting to emotionally dump and repeat the pattern. Because you, he doesn't have to do the work. The person doesn't have to do the work. It's up to you to go back and heal from the so that your past doesn't pretty much run your life. And, and if this is relevant to you, if this is something that you are ready to do, we have two spots remaining. I say two because we have two people registered today for the overview experience, which is a five-hour deep dive into healing that primitive relationship where you abandoned yourself. The first moment where it happened, how to how to heal that and fill the cracks in with the floorboard. And all of my clients are going to be doing, we do this together. We practice together, we hone our skills together. And normally this is just for my, my mastermind clients, but I am leaving a spot open for a handful of people, which we have two left. Many have just, I see on this, on this call right now, we're working Kind of attention to this this transmission you're already going to be there I'm so delighted to show you make sure if you haven't already send me i'm going to give you my email nema at drnema.com right there that's my email make sure you haven't i've gotten a few like from kathy from daniel uh, a few people have already emailed me today saying this is my intention and i have a very big new announcement to make about it for for people who are new at this game and you are kind of afraid of dipping your toe in. When you register for the upcoming workshop on Sunday, or it's Monday morning in, in Australia, early Monday morning in Australia, if you send me an email of what your intention is, I'm going to make damn sure that you get it. Within those five hours, what do you want to accomplish? And if you don't, I have a money-back guarantee. Because I thought about it, and all red people don't trust themselves. And so here you are, you know you have to deal, but you're on the precipice and you're about to jump, but you're like, oh my God, I'm about to invest. And it's the scariest thing, even though you're gonna be fine, your ego thinks it's guy. 
you start making up stories that you're going to go broke, you're going to go hungry, that you're, it's going to be too painful, that I'm going to cry and I'm never going to stop crying, that I don't trust myself. So I was like, okay, so let's do it. If, you, if it doesn't work out, you've lost nothing except five hours. I'm going to refund you your three ninety seven US. It's kind of like an irresistible offer. So now what happens is you now realize that money isn't actually the thing that's stopping you. you your ego thinks it is. Oh, it's COVID-19. I can't invest. Your ego thinks it's money. Then all of a sudden you remove the financial barrier and it's like, Oh shit, the money was just an excuse. I'm just too afraid. I just don't trust myself. To which I respond, yes, and the only way you get it is by trusting. So I'm leaving a link there. Send me a DM and let me know if you have any other questions. I'm going to rest up and relax with my sweetheart now. We're going to watch Ozark, which is a way that we love to connect. I don't know if you've seen it. I just digested season one season two we're in season three it's blowing mind and uh yeah it's a really really great uh i highly recommend it it talks about fear and expansion and such an amazing uh show and we're about to watch it right now but this is something that we really look forward to each night and uh, i'm signing off hopefully if you can resonate with this transmission tonight let me know let me know what came up for you do you have any other questions send me a dm or ask in the comments section please if you know somebody who's going through a breakup or a separation and they're in this toxic codependent cycle repeating the same pattern again and again in their relationships add them to this group let them know that we're all about taking responsibility for our triggers, healing the primary core wounds that are showing up in the body uh, that are responsible for this. Rather than becoming victim, we're going to actually become response-able by creating a, our own very own trigger-proof kit. So that's what the invitation is. Let me know who, if you know somebody, add them and let them know why it's important. It's never been more of an important time to have this conversation. It's really about healing um, intergenerational trauma. That's really the answer. It's going to save the world. Namaste.